Okay, sure stop. I think it's time for us to start. And thank you for coming. My name is Spike Wandong, and I'm a postdoc and research fellow from National University of Singapore. And my research is on the security of protocols, including authentication protocols, single sign-on, and some protocols related to trusted computing. So this leads to uh, today's talk. I'm going to look at the authentication protocols uh, and then uh, compromise the backup channels. Okay, so as more and more applications are used in our daily, la daily life, and a lot of web services are increasingly delivered sooner uh, under applications. Here, I want to show you some example in the social, uh, in the social networking. For example, in Facebook, it is reported that the number of mobile users of Facebook has surpassed the numbers of the desk, desktop users. And also on online banking, we, we can say that the users access their online banking through the applications are increasing. And, uh, and to, it is estimated that until 2012, there may be more than 80% of users access their mobile uh, banking through the uh, mobile applications. And also for the email services, and uh, the red line represents the users that access their email service through the mobile applications. We can say that the numbers are uh, dramatically increasing. So the problem is, can we just simply reuse the web browsers to access those web services? And uh, we know that there are two options when, uh, when implement the interface of the web services. The first one is through a native application, and the second one is through a web browsers. And they, either of them, have some advantages and disadvantages. For example, if we implement the interface through the native applications, we can have full use of uh, the device and the APIs provided by the operating system. And also, there is less programming limitation. And also, the native application is running faster than the uh, web, web browser based application. Okay, and for the web browser based application, it can, you know, it's like one implementation and multiple use. And also, it can reuse the uh, multiple advanced and well-developed de uh, well functionalities provided by the browsers. For example, the GS engine and the, like some security mechanisms like same origin policies. And also, it can be developed faster because you need, the developer just need to develop once and it can run over different web browsers. So, the question is why we do not just simply use web, uh, web browser. Let's just look at the, how the uh, reality will answer this question. So in 2013, there are just about 70%, uh, are there just about, sorry, 20% uh, web services are delivered through the web browser and the number is decreasing. So uh, as they're saying that, the browser has become a single application swimming in a sea of applications. So, in this scenario, let's look at how the mobile applications uh, will work and what kind of roles the mobile applications play in this scenario. So, essentially, the mobile application running like the web browser, it first uses some communication protocols to fetch a content from the web server and then do some content rendering. So however, if we look at the multiple vulnerabilities in the web browser, we can understand that this task is, uh, is a very hard and complicated task. For example, on the content uh, rendering side, there may be some code injection attacks, which means the attacker can somehow inject some malicious code into the content fetched by the uh, web application. And that, this may lead to some you know, cross-site scripting 
and some circle injection attacks. And there are a lot of uh, research has followed this, uh, uh, this side. And for the other side, and the web, well, the web application will use some uh, communication protocols to fetch a content. And if we say this uh, web, uh, uh, this Android application runs on Android site, there may be some new attack surface, and there may be some new trusted computing base, which means the uh, Android applications <coughs> must rely on this assumption to make the uh, communication protocol secure. So let's come to the focus of today's talk. We're going to look at how current applications will implement the web authentication protocol and schemes, and we'll, we'll look at how this uh, authentication protocols works, and we'll look at how the authenticator, which means some credentials in the authentication protocols, and how this uh, authenticator are managed by the uh, Android application. And as we just mentioned that, that may be new attack surface introduced in the Android side. So we'll look at their uh, backup channel, which I believe is a new attack surface for the web, web authentication protocols. So I basically will introduce how the backup can be dangerous uh, to, to the web authentication, and we will see how we can abuse these backup channels. And last, I will look at the, uh, some case study to show, the uh, to show the impact of such kind of threat. Okay, so in the first part is the uh, web authentication on Android. And uh, you must be very familiar with the web authentication. So an authentication basically is a process by server side to confirm whether a client is who it declared. And this must be one of the most used uh, web services. So how uh, uh, we want to look at how the Android applications will implement the web authentication schemes. And uh, our goal is to learn the approaches that the current or uh, kind of applications used to implement their authentication schemes, and we will focus on how the authenticators are managed. And uh, we have uh, analyzed, manually analyzed, the top ranked 100 applications from Google Play. And uh, well, our method basically is reverse engineering and uh, traffic analysis. So this is a short summary on our result. From this top uh, ranked 100 application, we found that there are 66 applications using the authentication scheme. And uh, in them, there's, there are three categories of authentication schemes. Basically, I will cover shortly in my talk, and including the basic authentication and single sign-on and the Android account manager. So for other 34 applications, why do why don't they use the authentication schemes? Because uh, most of them are standalone application. For example, the uh, news browser and maps and video players, which do not need the uh, basically the user's account on the server side. Okay, so the first scheme, the basic uh, authentication. So the basic uh, authentication refers to the traditional authentication schemes, uh, which can be you know, subcategorized into three kinds. The first one is based on the knowledge. For example, the password based and some security questions. And we found that 34 uh, applications out of the 40 applications use this password based schemes. And the, the second category is ownership based, which means the authentication uh, server assumes that the client holds some, owns some device or something that is special to that client. For example, the uh, SMS short message based and some, uh, some one-time password based schemes. And also there is another category called 
inherence, which means the authentication is based on some special thing of the client, for example, the fingerprint and even retina uh, patterns. But unfortunately, we didn't find uh, any application use this. However, the system uh, do use this inherence-based authentication. For example, in some new version of Android and new devices, they use the fingerprint to unlock the device. Okay, and I will introduce you that uh, there is also there was some work which tried to uh, investigate the confidentiality of these fingerprints, and that was presented in this year's Black Hat US. So let's do some abstraction how the basic authentication works. And uh, in the desk in the desktop site, the web browser will send some username and password to the web server. And the web server will generate some credentials like session ID, like some credential cookies, and they are planted into the web browser, right? So we call this credentials authenticators, which means they can indicate the client login session. And example including what I mentioned just now, the cookies session ID and some OAuth token, OAuth code. So how does the web browser protect this uh, authenticator? They basically use some same origin policy or content security policy or other security mechanisms. However, let's look at how the Android application will do this. So basically the Android application use some like REST for API or WebView, which was mentioned by previous speaker. So the Android application uses two interface to send the username and password to uh, server side. And uh, at, uh, similarly, the server side will generate authenticator. And this authenticator are located, in, uh, located into the Android side and it will need, uh, either put it into the content provider or use some shared preference, preference to store these authenticators. So eventually, these authenticators are located into the internal storage of this, this application, which located in the data data application name, this folder, okay? So the second scheme is called single sign-on. And uh, also we start from the desktop side. I believe most of you have looked at this and especially this part, which means you can use like your Facebook ID or your Google ID to log into a third party, uh, third party website. And we call this a single sign-on. Basically it's a capitalist like a single credential authentication schemes. And there are a lot of you know, major companies have implemented this single sign-on, for example, both the ID of Facebook and Open ID. So there are three parties in the single sign-on, right? The first is the user. And the user send is uh, username and password to the IDD, uh, identity provider, which we call it IDP, and get some token from IDP. And later, the user uh, present this token to a third party, which we call it Reliant Party or RP, and this token will allow the user to log into this party. So let's think about what is the single sign process on Android side. The Reliant Party now becomes the uh, application. And uh, if this application wants to use uh, single sign-on services provided by some IDP, it will import SDK released by the IDP, and examples including the Facebook Net, Twitter ID. So basically it means that this application can log into the, uh, can allow the user to log in, use their Facebook ID or IDP ID, right? So here I want to use a concrete example to show this process. And uh, this one is using the Facebook Connect and we divide it into two parts. The left-hand side part is uh, 
the scenario that there is no Facebook native app implemented on the device. So what will the SDK do? It will initiate a web view component and do the authentication with the Facebook server. And at this part, the Facebook server will generate some uh, secret cookie, and later this cookies are used as credential to get some OAuth access token from Facebook server. And for this scenario, both the secret cookies belonging to the Facebook and the, the OAuth access token belonging to the RP app are located in the internal storage of the RP application. Okay. And the right hand side scenario shows there is some there is native uh, Facebook app implemented in an Android device. So basically, the RP app will request IDP, uh, namely the Facebook application. So an application will send username and password to Facebook server and get the cookie and the OAuth access token, and it put the secret cookies into its own internal storage, and then. Put the, uh, transmit the OAuth access token to the RP application. So you can say that the uh, this kind of these two kinds of authenticators are located into different places, and you can just keep this in mind. And later I will show you the problem. So the last authentication scheme is called Android Account Manager, and I think most of you have seen this. So which means. Uh, you can add some accounts into the system. So this account manager is a centralized uh, and delegated authentication service and uh, account manager. So the app developer can only need to uh, implement uh, some, some interface, then it can delegate the whole authentication process and the authenticator manager, management to the uh, account manager. So let's show this how it, let's show how it works. So the developer basically need to implement two things. The first one is a uh, account authenticator, which means, okay, what kinds of account uh, you are going to use and what kind of type uh, is the account. And uh, the developer also need to create activity through which the user can enter his credentials. So after this, the authenticator will you know, do the, authentic, uh, the account manager will do the authenticator manage, management and it will load the, all the authenticator into a database located in this folder, which, is, uh, be, which belongs to the system. And I will let, later I will show you this. So if we think about the uh, protocol security, we probably have some have three layers. The first layer is on a design level, so which means uh, some protocols can be design flow. For example, miss some nonce, which lead to replay attack, or miss some signature, which lead to you know main and middle attack. So basically, we have some tool like Prover flag pad to detect such kind of design level problem. And the second level is implementation level. So the, the basic idea is even the protocol designed secure, the implementation can introduce some bugs, right? For example, in, in this case, and uh, not all of the messages are covered by the signature, which provides a chance to an attacker to do a main in the middle attack and also some authenticators can be implemented guessable by the attacker. Okay, so these are two traditional uh, layers that researchers must think about. And here we want we want to remind that we probably need to think about the infrastructure level, because the code, the implementation of the protocols, eventually rely on some uh, software stacks to work. So what if this software stack are compromised, right? So there is some previous study to look at uh, the, pass the password leakage to the compromised ADB channel, and this work is, uh, was presented in HitCon 
uh, last year. Okay, so let's keep in mind the infrastructure level security and we review the uh, three kinds of authentication schemes. In the basic authenticator authentication, the authenticator eventually located into the internal storage of the app, right? And also in a single sign-on case, the authenticators are also located in the story, internal storage of the apps. So let's look at this. This, uh, this is the internal storage located in the data data folder. And we can say the owner of this is the, uh, is the user ID of the application. And uh, we look at the account manager the authenticator are located in this data system user zero, and the owner of this folder is not system. So let's look at how it will be different uh, of this, th this kind of authenticator management. So before that, I would recall the isolation mechanism uh, of Android, which was introduced by a previous speaker. So we know that each application runs in an isolated sandbox, which means that each, of, each application can only access its internal storage, and even some application is compromised, it will not get access to the internal storage, right? But the problem is there may be some, okay, I, I would just skip this, which means we do some abstraction. Is an application usually simply located the authenticator into its internal storage, right? So we want to ask, what if this kind of sandbox is bypassed? Do you think there is any chance? Yes, there is. If we uh, think about the backup functionality, which is a quite you know, useful functionality, right? So in the backup function, uh, the backup function uh, nullity is basically works like this. We have some backup application which wants to back up the data belong to another application. So essentially this, this same boss must be violated, right? So the second part is how, how do we implement this backup in Android side? And the, there are two ways of uh, backup on Android. The first one is, is called a root-based backup, which means the, after rooting the device, the backup application can be granted the root privilege. Then it will naturally have access to any other application's internal storage. Right? And the second one is called the ADB back, ADB-based backup. Let's, let's look at this ADB-based backup. So I, I believe all of you know this ADB, right? It's basically a debugger uh, bridge. So um, a special thing I want to remind you is that the ADB is runs on a higher privilege than the traditional application, than the normal application. Although it's lower than root, but it can have some uh, privilege that the normal application does not have. So. How does this ADB-based backup work? And uh, let's think about, we have Android device, and the backup, app, the backup app runs on a user level privilege. So how do we implement the backup? We simply connect the Android device to the PC and run some command, ADB share, and run a command called APB process to start a process on Android side. And this one will get the privilege of the ADB. So basically it runs on a system level or signature level, right? Then it will have the privilege to do the backup. And then the backup application only needs to invoke this proxy to do the backup. Okay, so a little detail. We, the proxy will use this command bu1 backup and which, which will generate some backup data, which is a format of .ab. 
And let's look at this. So basically, it has a magic Android back backup, and it has some version, and also it uh, specifies some encryption algorithm. And by default, uh, this can be known, which means uh, ADB as uh, a backup data will not be encrypted. Okay, so this is how the uh, how this how this comment works. So once uh, this one is uh, executed, there will be some interface prompt to the user, and then user can choose to backup my app. All right. So let's think about how this backup channel can be a threat to an authentication protocol. The first one, if the backup application locate the authenticator belong to the victim application to some globally readable storage, then the malicious app can just read that one to get the authenticator. And the second, if the ADB proxy is not accessed, is not controlled or protected, some malicious app can also invoke the proxy to do the backup. and get the authenticator, right? And we call first case a backup data leakage, and the second case a backup capability leakage. So we have uh, summarized uh, all the backup applications on the Google Play, and so we found that there are uh, about five applications, and four are root-based, and we found that all of them are all of the applications locate the backup data into the SD card. And also there is uh, another ADB-based application called Helium, which also locate the uh, backup data to SD card. And also it have some interface that compromised, which I'm going to introduce in next slide. So this uh, ADB-based ADB backup is called Helium. And it is reported as one of the best application in 2013. And its developer is a developer of Synergy Mode, which I believe you know this. And they have already released 19 applications on Google Play and accumulate 15 million in stores. So I use this to show that even some advanced developer can also make some mistakes, which lead to the capability leakage. Okay, so let's look at how this Helium works. And we'll basically do some reverse engineering to, re to review the internals of Helium. And uh, in Helium, the ADB proxy is called share runner. So once the user starts this share runner from the PC, it will use a command called am star service, which basically will send the intent to the system to, initiate, to, to start the main app of Helium. At this stage, it also sends a one-time password to the, main, uh, to the Helium. So the Helium will, will locate this one-time password to its internal storage. And uh, then this share runner creates a local socket, uh, socket server. And if the main app of Helium wants to do the backup, it will send uh, to access this interface and use the one-time password as a credential. So you think about there's a socket server listen there and uh, there is a client and the client requests the server to do the backup and use the one-time password as a credential, right? So Helium allows two kinds of interface. The first one is user can uh, use the main activity to do the backup, and the, uh, the module is called a local backup, and the backup data is located in the SD card. And uh, besides this, Helium also creates a HTTP server, so the user can access this HTTP server from his PC and request Helium to do the backup. So you get this, 
and we have some pro uh, protected proxy, which is protected by the one-time password. And the main app of the Helium will send this password as a credential to invoke the proxy. So basically, it works in this way. OK, so we sh I will show a little of the code to show how this works. And initially, the proxy is start. And then it will create a local circuit, server circuit. And then it generates a UUID. You can think it as a completely random number. And this UUID is used as the credential. So how this, how this one-time password is transmitted to the main app of Helium. Basically, it will call this function called broadcast password. And let's look at how this broadcast password works. It will use a command called am star service. And the user parameter of the one-time password uh, so basically, this one will generate an intent and send this intent to share proxy, run, uh, share proxy service, which is the main app Helium. Right? So, so far, the one-time password is transmitted to the, uh, to the main app of Helium. And uh, we can find a logic flow here if we look at this, uh, this loop. So after uh, transmitted the one-time password to the main app of Helium, the proxy will listen on the socket uh, server for the request. So let's see how this handle socket works. Basically, it's a finite loop. So it just get requests from main app and check whether the one-time password is the correct one. If yes, it will serve the request. Otherwise, it will generate an exception. So let's look at this path. If the uh, one-time password is wrong, to a so exception, so it will call this one, and the execution will exit this function, right? So let's look at what will happen. It will enter the broadcast password again. At this point, think about if the Helium app is uninstalled by the user, and somehow the attacker install an uh, app which has the same name of the Helium. What will happen? The proxy will enter this again, right? And execute this command again. So basically, the one-time password was sent to the malicious app. Right? I hope you get an idea. So this is a concrete attack process. And uh, we, we can do some evaluation on this attack. Basically, um, it, it is not that easy because uh, it requires the Helium uh, uh, uninstalled by the user. And also, the attacker needs to install a malicious application which have the same name as a Helium. So the advantage for the attacker is that once obtain a one-time password, it can do the uh, backup at any time because it just need to use this uh, one-time password as credential to request the uh, proxy. And another problem is um, Helium does not do any wrapper on the proxy, which means it will directly execute the command that Helium main app sent to it. So basically, the attacker can generate any comments it wants the proxy to run and send to the proxy. And this comment will be run on a signature level privilege, right? And the, another uh, attack is attack the uh, web-based backup, which I mentioned before. So the Helium will uh, open a HTTP server and listen on 5,000 port. So basically, any application which has a uh, uh, internet per permission where have the you know where uh, is able to invoke this to, is able to access this part, yeah. right? So we also reverse engineering 
and find out the interface. And basically, uh, the malicious app only needs to access this URL and uh, send a get, uh, HTTP get request to fetch the list of all installed application. And then it can send a post request to do the backup and also do the restore. So basically, um, we also do the evaluation, evaluation again. So the attacker, the disadvantage for the attacker is the HTTP server uh, needs to be opened by the user and by default is closed. And also the application needs an internet permission. However, the advantage for the attacker is that it also can back up the target victim application at any time. And it is easier to implement than the first attack. Okay, and then the third attack is, you know, because the, data, the backup data is located in the SD card, so the malicious application can directly access the SD card and get the authenticator. But the, prop, the disadvantage, disadvantage for the attacker is uh, it can only success once the user do the backup on the target application. And advantage is you know, obviously that it is very easy to implement. Okay, so, so far we have, I have introduced how we can uh, compromise the web authentication protocols by compromising the uh, backup channels. And the third part, we are going to uh, evaluate how this threat will impact the real life, uh, real world application. So, <coughs> firstly, let's look at the extent of the ADB backup. And I want to uh, note that the application won't not be able to backup by the ADB proxy if it used the Android account manager for authentication. Because if you remember, the authenticator is located in the systems folder by the account manager. And the second case is if the application set the Android allow backup to false, then the ADB, back, ADB proxy will fail to uh, backup the application. However, this by default is true, this value is true, and we find that only you know, less than 10% application was specified uh, implicitly into, explicitly into force. So, we want to look at how many apps will be subject to this attack. Besides the previous top 101 application, we also randomly choose 10 categories of application from Google Play, and we get 10 apps from each category. So basically we do this thing. We first backup this application and get the backup data, and then we restore this data into another uh, clean application to see whether we can log into the victim's account. So through this, we find that there are 80 application will be infected, and uh, there are totally 120 application which will not be infected because 83 of them does not use authentication, and 37 of them, uh, among 37 of them, 23 use account manager, which if you remember, uh, will not be impacted by this attack. And also we found that there are 14 applications uh, explicitly specified that they do not allow to be backed So they will not be subject to this attack. Okay, so I want to show you some case study. This one is uh, attacks, attacks the Facebook application. So we capture the messages exchanged by the uh, Facebook native application and the Facebook server. And so we found that there is a post request 
from the Facebook native app to the server, and it sends a username and password to the server, and then the server will reply an access token and uh, two cookies, one called C user and another called XS. So we investigate them and find that this access token is basically a credential in subsequent requests. For example, the user can use it to post a new post. And the, the two cookies, say user and XS, are credentials indicating the, use, the user has logged into the Facebook. Okay, so all of them is lo uh, located in, uh, in this database and located in data, data, Facebook, internal storage. Which means if we can get the back app data of the Facebook application, we can you know, post anything, use an access token, and we can log into the weak team's account, use a C user and access. And the second case study is now uh, Facebook single sign-on. So basically, uh, I'd like to re uh, review a bit how this Facebook single sign-on works. So basically, the user input is username and password, and the Facebook SDK will send it to Facebook server and get these two cookies, if you still remember these two cookies, and later use them to get OAuth token from Facebook server. So this process is the authentication process. And besides this, Facebook implement authorization, which means later an RP application can use this OAuth token as credential to get some information stored on the Facebook server. So basically the user has, author has to authorize this process, which we call it authorization. So, what will happen if the attacker can get these cookies? And basically, the C user and XS, which belong to facebook.com, and the OAuth token are all located in internal storage of the RP application, right? So the problem is, Facebook completely de dedicated the secrecy of these two cookies to the RP application. Which means if the RP application allow these two cookies to be backed up, the attacker can use it to log into the user's Facebook account and do anything he wants. So this can completely violate the authorization, which is you know, the um, initial intent of this single sign-on. Right? So we... Uh, Tell, tell this to Facebook, and their opinion is they completely trust the RP application because they, they think that if the RP application is not trustworthy, then it can use phishing attack to get the password. But the problem is if the two cookies are under control of Facebook, it can set the allow backup to force to protect them. But if you delegate this to cookies to the RP application, then if the allow backup is sent to force, it can be subject to our attack, All right? So uh, the last part is how can we mitigate this, this attack? So basically for the uh, developer of backup application, they should try to build some secure ADB based backup, uh, which means they should uh, prevent basically the backup data and backup privilege from exposing to some malicious application. So they should have some, you know, secure access control mechanism or even formally verified mechanism on the ADB proxy side. And they should think about the secrecy of backup data. And uh, of course, they should manage the life cycle of ADB proxy, which means once the main app of the backup app is uninstalled, the proxy shouldn't be there, right? And for the developers of web applications, they should try to protect their authenticators. For example, if it is not necessary, they should disable this allow backup. 
and also they should avoid storing some password in the application's internal storage, and then to try to shorten the lifetime of the authenticators. And most importantly, they should try to avoid implementing their own uh, authenticator management. They can just you know, use Android account manager. So the last slides will be some summary and takeaways. Basically, we look at the, uh, how the compromised backup channels will impact the security of web authentication protocols. So the thing is, once we implement some functionality that will violate the essential protection mechanisms of an operating system, we should think about it, whether it is implemented secure. Because we are actually push the boundary, which you know break the sandbox. For example, in a research in Screen Milker, so they find basically some apps use the ADB proxy to the screenshot, and the proxy is never controlled, which means any application can invoke the proxy. Okay, and second, when we think about the security of authentication we should aware of the infrastructure level attacks. Okay, so that's all of this talk, thank you.